Hello, Singapore. Now, we are live now with the last lecture in my uh, 15 lecture uh, the course. Now, of course, uh, you know that I uh, think that some of you have attended and watched the two lectures from the earlier two weeks. Now, for today, I have chosen a topic that is extremely important to PL teachers. And even you are not a teacher, you are maybe a parent, are just an amateur adult player, you will find today's lecture to be very, very informative and practical. This is perhaps of all the three lectures I have done, this is the most direct to the point and the most practical. You can immediately apply whatever you learn today to your own playing and to your own teaching. Now, so today's lecture is titled Foundation of Piano Technique Part 1. Uh, while, uh, this lecture is actually divided into two parts. I'm going to offer this first part for, for, uh, for you all online for free. The second part is actually part of my teaching course. So if any of you are interested to uh, listen to the second part, uh, you will need to attend the lecture in person probably in end of June when in Singapore where the current circuit breaker uh, mini lockdown is lifted. Now, let's begin with a couple of quotes. This quote is by Georgie Sander. Georgie Sander uh, unfortunately has left us. Uh, he was a very... Uh, famous Hungarian pianist that recorded all the Bartok piano pieces and he also was also a very very well known piano pedagogue. Now he wrote, technique is a well coordinated system of motions conditioned by the anatomy of human body and the nature of piano. So it's about you know like the movements that we do to play to make sound the piano. And this is another one by Seymour Fink still alive and you know fair and also like a very very important figure for piano technique piano technique is more than the physical ability to render the printed page of music accurately it is the vehicle for interpretation the key to musical expression so basically that the end goal of techniques to really to express what we have in our mind that we want to be able to do what we envision in our head, the sound that we hear in our brain, and it comes out like exactly what we wanted to on the piano. So first, why teach technique? Uh, why learn technique if you are not a teacher? First, of course, it will immediately improve your playing standard. Now, second, you will learn pieces much faster. Now that is of course obviously you know that like uh, it's something that you all like to be able to achieve that you know rather than spending like two months uh on a piece and struggling through some very difficult part you want to be able to conquer that much faster so you can move on to the next piece and learn more piece to our repertoire. Now it can also improve your confidence. Now imagine that like when when you perform a piece for your friends and in concert you never feel in, in control I you, you feel like very, very, you feel that the piece is very difficult. Now, nobody wants that. And normally, that like, if you feel like that in the performance side, uh, most likely like, there will be some slips that like, it will end in disaster. So, you want to go up there on the stage and feel that like you are totally in control. And lastly, future proofing that you know that uh, if you are having lesson yourself uh, and you are teaching a student, your student may not be forever with you. Like maybe five years, ten years, then after down the road, then they will leave you and then they will set out on their own musical journey and you want to make sure that like that you equip them with the tool side to handle whatever that they will they will encounter in their own learning journey. Now let's define what is a good technique. Now for most people probably that you know that the first Thing they, they think when they, they see good technique is in speed and accuracy. So, I wrote there accurate. Now, 
that is probably how most people perceive it. Now, when they see a, a piano performance on YouTube, or on TV, or in a live concert, they will say, wow, that pianist can move the fingers very fast and it can hit all the notes accurately. That person must have a good technique. Now, that is true, but that's really only one aspect of good technique. Now, it needs to be consistent as well. Now, what is the meaning that, let's say that you know that you want to achieve a particular effect on the piano that you can consistently do it like five times in a row or ten times in a row exactly the same way without mistake. So that is consistent. Cannot like, there is, let's say you know you try to do a precision, there's a 50% chance of getting it right. Now that is not a good technique. And it's also efficient. That means that you spend fed as little effort as you can to achieve what you need to do. And this means also that, uh, that uh, in the actual play, piano playing, that you need to make sure that your playing like, is as, um, as free of additional tension as much as possible because that a lot of people tend to play very stiffly and that really causes a lot of problems. And it needs to be, at, at the end of the day, sustainable now uh this okay this icon is given my powerpoint but what actually we mean by sustainable is that it needs to be healthy in the long run now a uh, piano uh, should not be like an olympic sport uh, where that you know that all these athletes are uh, they know they have shelf life after a certain age their body cannot take the rigor of the training anymore but with piano playing if you are learning technique correctly, you should be able technically be able to perform well into your 80s, 90s. Pianists perform all the way to 90 years old, 80 years old, like the great Vladimir Horowitz. And, um, and uh, I think, I, I can't remember the name, but somebody uh, a few years ago, he passed away in the 90s and they had to cancel a concert uh, because that he was supposed to, 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 be, to, to, be, to be playing for the concert. Now, I understand that you know that like that that perhaps like not many of us like can meet all these four criteria now let's just take example even the most fam even famous concept pianist like example lang lang now for for many people like many people aspire to be lang lang they want to play like him to have the same uh, level of you know playing as him and now let's define let's see whether you know he has good technique now he can play accurately he can play consistently but was he efficient not really there's a lot of additional movement was it sustainable not of course not because that he suffered an injury when he was repairing the Ravel left hand piano concerto so you can see here like that you know that now this does not mean he has bad technique but his technique has issues now, so we need to recognize that. So we cannot just uh, be uh, shallow and think, oh, look, as long as I could hit the right now, right time, I could more or less do the details, that is a good technique. Now, this is important because uh, I've seen many people, like, and i met many people and teachers that, like, that suffer like, from effects of bad technical training. Like I met a, a teacher who is in her late 30s, and she said that, now, whenever she can't even play any difficult piece anymore, anything that is like example a great seven or eight, she she's just practicing it for like half an hour. Then she was already in pain. Now, and the strange thing like when she was young, she practiced two hours. It, there was no issue at all. Now, unfortunately, that you see here as we grow older, our body ability like to repair itself decreases. That is why children can get away with bad technique much more easily than adult. I started learning piano as a late teenager at the 17 years old and immediately I was hit with the effects of bad technical training right from the start. Now I will elaborate a little bit more later about what I encounter but suffice to say actually the good technique la, is universal. Now it, uh, there is really no difference uh, between what is a good technique for a child and for an adult. It's just that you know that you can get away with it more as a child because your body is still growing, your body can repair any damage to muscle and joint like much more easily than an adult. Now, for this lecture, 
uh, this uh, we are focusing la, on the development of technique for beginners and lower level maybe up to grade 2 ABRSM so the learning goals at this level is one of course to teach what is a good posture tension free tone production very important and then uh, uh, the specific technical difficulty we'll be dealing is how to execute contrast within two hands effectively both dynamic contrast and articulation contrast and lastly to strengthen finger joints and fingertips now uh, speaking about this last point i know that there's there has been a move in the recent years especially in the us and uk like to move towards a wholly arm based playing now personally i think that is good but we cannot neglect that finger training because you know finger finger actions are, are still important there are pedagogues that say that like you know we should not subject ch children lower than nine years old to piano training because the joints won't be able to handle it but I think it's okay and you know that if you really want to play fairly well it's really better to start young but we do need to strengthen the finger joint the fingertips so we could play all the all we could play like all the advanced repertoire well unfortunately that unlike Falinis, we cannot use smaller size and narrower key keyboard so we do have to deal with that issue now the first thing what is a good posture so what are the elements of good posture now we are going to talk this in great detail for the next few slides with pictures and demonstrations now the first it needs to uh, you need to allow complete freedom of movement now that is uh, we are going to see this uh, later why second it has minimum tension now be aware we can't technically play piano without tension but what we can do is we minimize unnecessary tension and last point it may not be the most natural or comfortable positions initially now i like to liken learning technique on the piano to learning how to use cutlery when you are young now try to give a fork and spoon or chopsticks to a young child no children will ever figure out how to use those cutlery by themselves you need to teach them because the so-called correct way to use them is not natural but the point is they need to practice and we need to correct them all the time until eventually it becomes automatic now good techniques like that what we consider as good technique is not obvious initially it may actually be even counterintuitive but we need to tell our students uh, to bear with it and to keep reminding themselves to do it eventually one day it becomes so automatic they don't think about it anymore now let's talk about sitting how to figure out the sitting posture now this is important because really is you should be going through this uh, in the first few lessons you have with a student and whenever i deal with transfer student if i get grade 8 and diplomas 90% do not know how to sit correctly and how to position themselves correctly now first um how to figure out a good sitting posture now we start with the feet now feet first because you see here like you know that uh the feet will, will determine you know the other positions of the body first at all time place your right feet on damper pedal now if you are dealing with a child with a short legs like most of us do when we are teaching six to ten years old please get an extender or at least a stool that that, that allow them like to place the to, to rest their feet on it rather than letting their feet dangling in the air now i encourage you like even from grade one a beginner to teach your student to rest the right feet on the damper pedal now there are very few pieces that require the use of pedal at those level but 
it's good to get used to it right from the start. So what you want, now you can't see my feet from here, so that's why I take a picture of it. Now you can see that here, the right feet, the ball of the right feet is resting on the damper pedal, which is the right pedal, was with some of you not sure what is it. And then the left feet needs to be placed to the left of the una corda pedal. Now you can see here right, that more or less the feet makes up the V-shape and consequently the type also shape like, uh, the letter V. So remember that. Now it is not a combined V but it's like a spaced out V but that's important because you see here, now most people like they tend to place their feet like you know like more uh, more like you know like next to each other and this cause like them to feel very unstable when they are playing piano and so you do not want that. Now, uh, unfortunately, that you know because of the time today, so I cannot really demonstrate all the why well, the, the, the not so not so good technique. Uh, normally, that I will go through this in the tutorial, but I just try to uh, tell you all uh, what is the what are the important bits today. Now, then let's go to the actual sitting posture. Now, first, you need to sit at the center of the bench. That is important because you see here like now most children like, naturally they will sit right at the end of the bench. Now you can see here like, from the camera that now it's very it, it, it is somehow like more comfortable to sit right at the right at the right at the end of the bench, uh, uh right at the end of the bench because like, it feels more logical. But we need to teach them right from the start to sit at the center. Uh, uh, some teachers are uh, even advocate like sitting right at the edge of the bench. Now this will give the body more solid grounding on the ground but but the main reason for this uh, is actually like and to expand like the surface area of the body the larger the surface area the body and the bench occupies the more stable you feel that's actually the main reason now so you want to see at the center of the bench and the four arms like when they combine together need to be like in the a, a shape like this so you so what i do normally with the children with the and the other transfer student like now we start first i uh, you know by putting the hands together this way then now they know uh, normally ask them to draw the heart shape and then they, they will bring their hands together this way and then they need to sit far enough to allow the elbow to move in front of the chest now this is important naturally that most people, children and adults, they want to sit as close as possible to the piano because it feels extremely comfortable. So we, you always see this problem. That you know the student will sit very near and you can see that immediately the, the, the butt is right at the end of the bench and they will play this way. Now you can see here, like, although somehow like, you know, this does feel very comfortable, but you can see that it, the range of movement is very limited. You can't, you, it's very difficult to, to move. For example, if you just want to close your hand over, you can see that there's a problem here already. Whereas, uh, you know, if you sit far, further, you can actually like, you know, close your hand much easier. So you can see the range of motion is very limited because the, arm, the upper arm is too close to the body. Now, what I encourage uh, my students to do, how to figure out a good sitting distance is to actually like to start from a position that is less comfortable and further. Now, if you start from here, you will most likely not adjust because it already feels comfortable. But if you place the bench very far, like this, now this is far. You can see that it is not comfortable and you can gradually move the bench nearer until you achieve the perfect balance of comfort and posture. So for parents who have children and for teachers, now you can do that every lesson for the beginner side. Purposely like put the bench further from the piano and make them move it nearer towards the piano to get the correct sitting distance for them. Now, how about the sitting height? You need to sit high enough 
to allow the entire arm apparatus to be above the key level. Now, th I understand that sometimes this is not possible because uh, unfortunately that lie that a lot of pianos nowadays still come without adjustable stool. Now, if that is the case, I encourage you to buy one immediately. Nowadays, China made one is only fifty dollars to hundred dollars. It's they're very cheap. Um, if that is not not possible at the moment, you can make put some hard pillow to increase the height of the bench. Although that is not very safe for the children, uh, but for adult it's okay. But the point here, like in. If you are sitting too low, you will realize that like that that you know that you have to raise your arm, you have to raise your shoulder to play piano. So you look like a like a witch. It needs to be high enough that the shoulder at a good height and so you can raise the elbow high enough. So that's actually the main point. So you can see here like, now this is a good posture. I consider this good posture. If you want to test screenshot, you can go ahead. So what how about the hand posture? Now, this is what I forget. Now, some of you may have different idea. Now, I understand that like technique may differ from region to region, and I understand that based on my previous discussions with other teachers, side, that each of us may have a very strong opinion on what is correct and what's not correct. So I'm just giving you, sharing with you what I think is a good technique and what I have been teaching to my students and what I follow in my own practice and playing. Now, you don't have to follow what I teach you, but please do try and see whether like, like that that gives you like a better control of your playing overall. Now, for the hand posture, you want to see that a nice sloping line from the elbow to the knuckle. So you can see here that the elbow is lower than the shoulder. The wrist is lower than the elbow and finally the knuckles is a little bit lower than the wrist. So you can see so you can take a marble and roll it down all the way to the knuckle. And this will give you like a feeling of weightlessness to the hand. Now, there is something that I always tell my students. You need to feel like the hand like is like a pair of balloons and they are just really hanging loosely from the wrist. This way, like, you know, when you play piano, that, like, everything, like, feels a lot more uh, lighter and effortless, rather than, you know, that it, like, it's a like struggle, you know, it's like you're fighting with the piano. Now, so let's talk about the hand shape. Uh, we have, we are get, we'll be getting to the actual playing and exercise later, but we need to talk about all the basics first. Now, what is, uh, what are the sum of the hand shapes that, like, that we can use when we play piano? Now the first is what we call the claw shape. Now you know that a lot of pedagogues use this term, the claw shape. This term is kind of a misnomer because that really is like that you don't actually claw your hand like a chicken, or like a bird. It's more like holding a ball, or holding a hamster. So there, you know that uh, you can like you can hold a debug up to you. What I do normally, I. Uh, I, if for the very young children, I have a little ball they can hold to, to so they can get the shape of the hand. Now, in this shape, the mid joints and the nail joints are visible. Now, before we go on, okay, I'm sorry, I think I should have put a slide about all the different body parts, but this, uh, some quick anatomy lesson. Now, this is what we call the wrist. I'm sure most of you know that. This is our knuckle. The joint directly after the knuckle is called the mid joint and the joint after the mid joint here, the, the final one, is called the nail joint because it's directly before the nail. In the claw shape, you can see from the, my, my picture and you can see from the, the other window that the mid joints and the nail joint are visible. And you can see here that like, all the joints are lower than the knuckles and the thumb is close to the second finger at the index finger now why do we do claw shape now the claw shape like is unfortunately like, not natural nobody 
is going to figure this out on yourself on by themselves you need to teach them now but why is it important because that actually minimizes the surface contact with the kids that means like the the amount of the fingertips that are in contact with the kids are as small as you can that will give you the most efficient energy transfer so it gives more attack in other words brighter tone now this also means you have extremely precise control of the volume and you could achieve what we call the non-legato articulation easily now that is actually one of the main requirement now non-legato is a type of legato that is just very slightly separated example you can hear now then you can hear the very clean separation between the notes so that is mostly used like for majority of pieces that like that require pressure shot like that like example and so on and you can see you know example that in the minute walls so on so you can see that like you know that is important to do now then we go to the next shape now which is called the extended shape now extended shape like is actually like our natural relaxed hand shape so let's just imagine that like you go to the toilet and then you you know that you wash your hand and then you shake your hand away yeah you try to shake away the water now you get what we call the extended shape now it is the natural relaxed hand shape it feels fully natural without any tension so you could see that here like the fingers actually are still shaped quite nice and in the picture you can see that it, they uh, that the fingers are still more or less curved but there are some subtle differences between that and the claw shape now the mid joints are still visible but the nail joints are now collapsed now you can see so this nail joint becomes straight but be very careful this does not mean they are flat fingers so now these are flat fingers now flat fingers are bad because they causes a lot of tension now the characteristics of this obviously there are more of the fingertips that are in contact with the key so this means that uh, you have less attack it will give you a darker sound there's also less precise control of the volume so it is not probably not the best option to for the pieces that require very soft sound and then it's a lot easier to do legato with this so obviously like this is meant for pieces that like they are more cantabile I express example now you can see that you can see that in the in the my playing now so let's go to the next one the hand position now and i need to talk about this because that you know that uh i think most of you are watching this uh, in singapore and we are most of most of us are asians are uh, chinese are uh, malays are uh, indians and we are not very large people like the caucasians are uh, the african american so our hands are uh, unfortunately are not big and piano is not made for asians they are made for Caucasians. Now, one of the main thing of a good technique is to be able to maintain the hand shape as much as possible, whether it's claw or extended, so we don't go flat. Now, the moment that our fingers go flat, we have problem. Now, to prevent that, what we can do, we need to align the thumb and the pinky as much as possible so you can see here the thumb is here and the pinky is there so you can draw a straight line from the thumb and the pinky and it's parallel to the key now what happened like, if the thumb and the pinky are, are not aligned so you could see that now you see the pinky is here and the thumb the thumb like, is at the end of the white right key now you could see that like the other fingers are, are immediately like you know that uh, nearer to the black key and you can see that the fingers start to go flat now my hands are for adults quite small but imagine a young seven or eight years old girl will have even smaller hand and that will be you know disastrous for them to do that so 
you need to learn to move in and out your hand if you are playing a black key piece you need to move in you need a, a piece that has the black keys so you need to move in when you need to play a black key to keep the hand shape now of me of course that like if you are playing a piece like example this one now it's all white key you can keep the hands uh, at the end of the white key now that's okay but let's say you are playing something like this now that is an E flat major and you can see here like now I, I, could, I, could, I could play it like with a consistent hand shape because I keep my hands like closer like, to the black keys now so the idea is that uh, it's really is that uh, you want to maximize like the length of the keys available to the fingers and we always aim at the edge of the black keys now why the next few slide we explain that now so we are going now to the tone production now it really amazes me like even for piano teachers that like even for piano teachers are like, many of them like do not understand like how do sound is actually produced inside a piano now that is important because that if you play instrument does not matter whether is it a, a piano a violin you need to know how is the sound generated so you can modify the variable side to get the sound that you want now first side uh, i have provided here a picture of the inside of an adult piano i think it's a lot easier to see what happens here now there are plenty of youtube video that shows you the actual mechanism in motion so you can go online just search for damper mechanism piano that piano damper mechanism in youtube or something it will give you a lot of videos for you to to learn but i'm just going to tell you briefly what will happen now you can see here like now this thing here where the cursor is on the slide that is the hammer so hammer hit string those are the string you can you can see that here like for each sound or uh, each pitch it actually has a few strings connected to it now below here that where the cursor is uh, is the damper now the damper by default uh, is always in contact with the string and as the name implies a damper damps a sound so when the damper is in contact with the string the string cannot vibrate and cannot produce sound so let's see what happened now when we depress a key what happened here the first thing the damper leaves the key so that, that will allow the string to vibrate the hammer moves back and emit and then it will hit the string the string vibrate and the tone is sounded then the, then the hammer moves away from it so then afterwards you will hold the sound when you hold the sound the damper still remains away from the string the string continues to vibrate and then when you release the key the damper moves back to the string and the string stop vibrating and the sound is cut off now what this means are uh, technically on the piano that like that the way to execute all those things are actually different now to produce a sound or to depress the key you need a lot of weight to actually hold the sound you need quite a little bit less weight so for example you can just uh, slow depress the key now there's the amount of weight that you need to hold the sound and then to cut the sound off you need to make sure the finger like as light as you can now bear this in mind because uh, this will come into play later so let's talk about characteristic of tone because you need to modify a sound so you need to know what you can actually modify in a sound we have first volume you can modify a volume so you can play softly or loudly now if you have more weight you have more volume because the hammer will hit it with the more force now so you can just demonstrate easily let's say you use just a second finger let it drop freely 
and then you combine three fingers now you get a louder sound immediately that is simple to demonstrate you can also modify the color whether is it a dark tone a bright tone now what actually changes is the rate of how fast the key descend so if you gen if you gently depress the key down you get a darker sound if you immediately make the key goes all the way down you get a sharper sound you can also modify the depth whether you want a shallow or fuller sound very important for balancing left hand right hand now you could play all the way down to the bottom of the key or you could just play on the tip of the key you get a much thinner sound now the depth of sound is often confused with volume it is Okay, now, okay, I'm sorry, there's some technical issue, my PC crashed just now. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, I think we have lost them. Uh, we, have, we lost one camera here because I think that camera causing issue, so it's, so we'll just have to deal with the, without the, uh, this, uh, the, the small camera there. Now, so, okay, let's pick up from where we left off. Now, there's one, another thing you have to, dis you have to consider, register differences. Now we'll talk about this a little bit more later in the if you are uh, if some of you will be in the second part of the lecture. Now, but just briefly, because of the way a piano constructed, so you have thinner string on the upper register and thicker string on the lower register. Now, what this means that. The higher you go, the more weight and the less key velocity that you need. And then the lower the register, the less weight and the more key velocity that you need. Now, okay, translation for for most of you, when you play lower part, you, you need to play softer. And when you play hard, higher part, you need to play louder. Okay? Now. So let's so let's talk about this. Let's talk about the next point. Uh, okay. Now, let's hope that nothing crops up again because that I hope to uh, to end this end this uh, section on time. Now, when we play piano, there are four starting point of movements. The first is finger or knuckle. Now you could see that. You can see here from the from the from the camera that you know, that you could move your your fingers could move from the knuckle. So that's the first point of movement. Now second, you could move your wrist. You can do this. Or you can do this. Then you can also move your elbow. Now you can move your elbow this way, like open elbow, close elbow, and then you could move your shoulder. But I would say 90% of the movements we do on the piano actually come from the knuckles and the elbows. Now, I will explain this in the next few slides. Now, but I will go through all the four actions. So at least uh, you know that you know when to use them. Now, the first side is the finger or knuckle action. So the basic movements, the finger gets heavier and it will depress the key. So you can see here, now I just rest the fingers on the key, then it gets heavier and depress the key. 
Now, then the finger gets lighter and it will hold the key and the finger gets even lighter and the key, natural opposing force of the key pushes up the finger. Now, you can see that here, right? It's only one single movement. Now, most students, uh, no matter their age, right? If you just tell them to go to the piano and make any sound, they will start to do this. Now, they will, uh, they, they will slam their fingers down and they will lift their fingers up. But you can see like, that is a very intuition way to produce a sound. Using pure finger action is a lot more efficient because all you have to do is to make the fingers go heavy. There's just one motion. And then you, you gradually cut the weight of the fingers to hold the sound and to clear the sound. Very efficient way. Now, so you can see that like, I know that some, this is maybe totally new concept for many of you because that uh, we always think of playing piano as striking the key, uh, hitting the key, uh, pressing the key, but really it's like you should sing the finger in rather than press. Yeah. Now, when the fingers should remain in shape, if you start to see flat fingers, as in the case of, uh, you know, example, you play piano and start to see this. Now, a collapsed finger, a curled finger, that means like, there's a lot of tension like in your hand and there's a big no-no. Now, let's talk about raising fingers. Now, I know that this topic may be a bit more controversial, but my opinion, it is okay to raise fingers up to the knuckle level so you see here like now assume that you keep the elbow reasonably high you could see that like that the mid joint is lower than the knuckle and you can actually lift it safely like to the knuckle without collapsing the knuckle that will give you increased attack and louder volume that is obviously like important like for non legato and clips passage work so example if you want to play you could see here now you could see the fingers going up and down and it gives a fake clip side sound for the thumb you need to aim at the center of the thumbnail. Now, a lot of people like often they aim at the side of the thumb. Now, there's a lot of problem that comes from this. And in fact, that like I would say that like most of the problem arising from piano technique like can be simply solved like by correcting the thumb movement and the positioning. Now, a lot of people when they play piano they have a good shape, but then when they start to move the thumb, they do this. So example, now let's say just we take we take the same passage we did just now, but with a downward thumb movement on the side. Now immediately that like that the entire arm clock and you introduce like additional arm movement. That's not good. So what I do here, I aim at the center of the thumb, and the thumb become almost straight down. That will help you to maintain like the of all shape of the hand and the arm. For the pinky, pinky is a weak finger. It has the least amount of weight. So it needs often additional action for more volume. So often we reinforce the pinky with the elbow and wrist movement. Like example, you know that, you know, like just playing scale, you see example. Now then it gives more sound to the pinky. Now, wrist action, left and right rotary movement. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, we actually use very little wrist movement. Now, the wrist often needs to move naturally as a consequence of moving the elbow. But the point is that uh, we really seldom uh, generate movement 
on the wrist, but some pieces need it. Example, pathetic sonata. Example. So you see, like you know this like rotary movement. So obviously, it's good for broken in interval, broken octave and intervals. Like you know, example, you want to reach. You can do that. Yeah. So it's like the, so you so you rotate the wrist. Now, lateral movement. Now, your wrist also can move laterally. Now, uh, unfortunately, the small camera is down because I, will, I really wanted to show you using the small camera, but, you know, it's basically like mopping. So it's like this. Like, you know, like, like if you see a horse racing, like, the head can go left and like this way from, from the, without moving the neck. Now, it is very useful like to play passage work this way so example you see here like example when you play scale but i wrote here whenever possible elbow rotary movement is preferred now later on we'll i'm going to demonstrate to you how to practice scale now you realize that like that it is actually far more efficient uh, to let the elbow move first and then the wrist side we keep it very relaxed and the wrist just follows the elbow movement now when we let the wrist be totally free it will actually naturally move in a lateral movement so example i open up my elbow you could see that my wrist move laterally but the point here like that is the elbow that moves not the wrist so that is important later on we will talk about this more now it allows bigger intervals without changing hand shape now let's talk now about the elbow action now this is by far like you know that uh, beside the finger action the most commonly used action but for most people that like they were not taught how to utilize this so in the end at the end of the day that like that they were stuck like using either release action or finger action but i encourage you teach your student like, to use elbow action now that is the main movement to play chords and octave now let me show you why it's elbow action now look carefully now you see the how the you see where the elbow is now i'm going to play just a chord now example you see i just play this this is the opening of the Schubert 959. Uh, uh, then, now, example, you can see that now the elbow goes in and out. Then, your hand and the wrist side fall, follows naturally. That will give you like uh, brighter sound which is like you know like translation like is is more pleasant now most of us uh, when we encounter octave and chord like we think downward so we think of pressing the key downward now let me show you what happened if you do that you see see here like the sound like sound like a bit pressed i don't know how well it comes up in the stream like right? but definitely like the sound like is a bit more muted and in the sense that it sounds like a little bit more jarring because like there is no clear definition like between the sound you cannot actually hear like individual sound you just hear as a mush as a mush of sound together now it gives you the best compromise between brightness and volume now i'm down motion more volume but less definition so that's not so good now you could adjust the brightness by changing the distance or the attack now we are uh actually that they actually that like that you can also apply this uh, to single note now so example you know you could like do like uh you know that uh like uh, uh like this so you, you can you can do that also for for a fast piece like that example you know to do elbow, 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 elbow for the right hand also. That works also. Now, 
the elbow arm movement, which is a important movement, it does not produce any sound, but it clears up the tension in the uh, in arms and hands. So it's look like this. You can see that here after I play a chord, and then my elbow rises, and it flies away. So for example. Anyway, that now when you do that, um, when you combine it with the elbow in movement, like it looks like like you are plucking the sound of the piano. So that is actually a good uh, analogy to give. So I always tell my student like imagine that like you are pulling or plucking the sound like you know that if they ever been to a farm, you imagine you tell them you start pulling a carrot or potato like out of the ground. So like that. So you can see here like now example you know just using the example of the shibat. So you see now. So gradually lift your elbow up and then take off. So just now remember what I say that you need a lot less weight to hold the key or to hold the sound. The elbow movement like is a natural way to cut the weight of the fingers. It can be combined with many other action also. Now, elbow rotary movement is like this. So I I show you using my left arm. So you can it's basically you know it complies of two basic movement: opening up the, the elbow and then you know the rising of the elbow. So when you combine them, it moves in an oval shape. Now that is very useful to play cantabile melody. Like example, just now in the Chopin, I demonstrated. Example and so on them. So you can see that even for single melody, like it works fairly well. It gives that much warmer quality and more control because you could fairly like. The size of the rotation, like to control the actual volume. Now, obviously, lah, it is more suitable for the legato articulation. Now, you may be thinking, "Wow, this is a lot to teach for beginners." You don't have to teach all this to beginner first, but I I included them as part of this lecture because if you are a teacher, you should know all this. That's why it's called foundation of piano technique. Now, uh, if you realize that, like. All these are fairly new to you. I encourage you like to actually like learn them yourself. Preferably with a very good teacher who knows all this, uh, because that you know that uh, having a constant and constructive feedback are important. You do not want to learn things wrongly because when you practice something that's wrong, it just makes it permanent. So remember, that's why I was telling my student practice. Does not make perfect practice makes permanent. So you want to have perfect practice. Perfect practice makes perfect. So that is more more correct. Now finally we have shoulder action. Now this is a uh, probably like only utilized in very advanced music like mainly those big music that requires a big sound like Rachmaninoff a certain list, a Bach talk. So the basic movement is that cycling the shoulder. It will give you fairly big sound, but of course that you can't control it. It is at most F F F R triple F. It is suitable to play fast single, loud single notes and chord example. Just for just to give an example, yeah. Now, but there is a a generally that like we only teach this like for the higher level. Now let's talk about some exercise and attitudes uh, that we can go through. Now uh, I have here like is a Hazel chord, but let's just uh, backtrack a little bit now. So some of you will be asking me, so how do I start with a beginner? Uh, that who who do not know how to read music. Now normally that what I do, we can just do a very simple exercise using one hand get in the five fingers. You could just like you know that uh, do like C D E F G, 
or you know that uh, you can also do like you know like E F sharp G sharp A B for the black keys and you just like teach them like to sing the finger in one by one and then release. Now, if some of them cannot do that, you can use this. You can combine the thumb and middle finger, a second finger, and let it like gently fall and then spring up again. So that is what I do lah for uh, beginner that. But most people lah should be able to do this one, the Hazel Cop five finger sequences with slur and staccato. Now the score is here on the slide, but when I teach this to students, I teach them by rote. That means I just play them and they imitate. Now it is very simple. The exercises are, are at most one bar or two bar in length and then they are repeated over the octaves. So example, you know, let's just take a number one. That's only the pattern. And then you just repeat it again over the seven times for the octave. Very simple to teach, right? Now, so you can see this exercise is good because it immediately that like utilizes that all the uh all the all big all all the fingers except the number four, and you also teach them like to play staccato correctly, which is to just like separate the note rather than to play them bouncily. Now and then the second one. They start to use, you know, this a uh, little bit of the lateral movement to help them like handle the uh, pinky movement. Now, then the left hand also, and so on. Can okay? now uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I just uh, run through briefly. Now, uh, of course, you know that if you effort to decide this and to do the tutorial with me, I will go through a lot more in detail in the tutorial. But this is just a lecture, so I could not possibly teach everything in this lecture. Now, but this is a useful one. The book is actually from this book. Uh, this exercise from this book called Technique Builder. Uh, let me show you the book. This is the book. Very useful. It's all like uh, short exercises in, uh, in that that covers uh, a wide range of technique. So you can uh, you can also apply this uh, for the higher level. Now, let's go to the next one. Now, uh, so like just now I say that you know that like we also need like to strengthen like the finger joints. So, and to learn the finger action. So normally that I use Chenny. Now you can also use Hannon. I mean, I I know that a lot of us love Hannon. But the reason why I don't give Hannon like because for children especially because there is, if you see the first exercise uh, there's a uh, that gap like, between the pinky and the fourth finger, and that actually cause tension like, for young children. So normally I don't give Hannon like for children, but I give them Chenny instead. Now. There are two that normally I give to young kids. One is the uh, Opus Five Nine Nine Number Eighteen, the right hand one, and then the next one that you see here, Five Fifty Nine, the left hand. Now let me be clear that first side, you don't have to play the entire piece. You could just give, for example, eight bars, and you don't have to treat this like a performance, a musical piece. Now first and foremost. We are treating this like a pure exercise, so it may sound horrible. In fact, that like the first thing I ask them to practice side for the right hand for the young kids side and the adults is to do this. You know that uh, now because just now I said about raising the finger. that sounds very nasty but it is good to it is good like you know to strengthen the fingertips and the finger joints and you will see that like a lot of talent training program like, I actually encourage them to play the journey like in this way now give me one minute I'll bring some water after I drink this cup of water like, I will start to present this lecture like in another language okay that's a joke I'm thinking only Singaporeans you will get it
but I will still continue in English. <laughs> now, now. So anyway, when anyway, now this uh these exercises are uh, these two chenny are useful because it introduces uh, you know good finger action. So you can uh, now you can practice it different way. You don't have to play it, it exactly the same way. You can do it different way. For example, you can do it like with just a sinking motion. You could play it like. And so on. Now, the left hand light plays the accompaniment for this. And remember, just now I say at the lower level that one of the issue that we have to tackle like, is to teach students to learn to do contrast between the melody accompaniment. Now, for the left hand, you can normally ask the students to play them like fairly soft, keep the elbow fairly high, and just like gently play it very softly. Then combine the right hand. And so on. Now so that is a good way to do it. So you like so you exaggerate the difference between the hand side very big. Of course you can do hand separate. Now normally that my student only do eight bars of this because that I like to keep the exercise short. Now if they wish to to learn the entire thing, that's up to them. If they like the piece and they want to play the entire thing, of course they will come to do so. But for exercise, that I like to give them small bite at time. Only for concert attitude, I insist that they must learn like the entire thing. Now that is the number eighteen. Now this is the number fifty nine for the left hand. So this is a uh, uh, the same thing except now the left hand. And so on, okay. So uh, actually, that most of the time we just have to make them play that way. You don't have. I mean, of course, that it sounds very nice if you play. And so on, but. Uh, remember that like that when you give an exercise that like the point is uh, is for them to improve a technical aspect it's not for them to enjoy the piece like that now let's go to the next one now this is by Kula now let me uh, let me say something before we actually go on now when I accept transfer student like I'm often amazed at like that many like did not have any experience like playing exercises and attitudes so basically the teachers are, are just using the exam pieces like to teach whatever they need to know the technique and obviously that this will leave like many deficiency in the technique and that also there are a lot of problems are like bad technique and weak fingers and so on like that but those who are lucky enough that the teachers have some idea okay we need to have some regime for the technique maybe i should give them some hannon some chelny uh put muller and then they learn the bit they learn all the exercise side but then the teacher only assign them the pieces side without actually telling them what to improve and what to wash out for now all these exercise are really only truly useful like if they are work like with a specific goal in mind and you as a teacher need to tell the student what they are actually working on like just now example for the journey the objective like is to strengthen the fingertips and if that is the objective then the exercise like needs to be practiced in a specific way if the objective is to play fast then of course you have to ask them to play fast now so and so on like that. Now you need to establish first what is the objective la, of giving the exercise and then you ask the student to practice it in a way that works towards that objective. Now the next one that I assign and this is a standard piece of, in my studio is this piece by Kula. Now I'm not sure from which collection this is taken off but this particular exercise I, is in 
ABRSM Graded Piano Forte Studies Grade 1 is this book, a very old one, you know, the green color book. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of them, are, a lot of the pieces in them are excellent. This is useful because you, uh, if you can see from the score light, right, the left hand and the right hand light right, are fully in five finger positions. And I use this piece right, beside to teach the good finger action for the right hand and the left hand. You can see the right hand and the left hand takes turn to play the semi quavers. You could also see that, like, that they have to play different rhythm. So this is a good opportunity to teach them contrasting articulation. Like example in the second line. Now it's not easy to do, ah. So you actually, uh, so you need to you need to teach students how to do that, and you can they can they can. It's a simple sounding piece, uh, but there's a lot of technique that uh, you can learn from this piece. So this is a useful one, right? You can give this side uh, to a student like uh, who is pre grade one. And remember always uh, it's always a good idea like uh, to pre emptively tackle technical difficulties. Now you want to be able to make the student do contrasting articulation and dynamics right from the start. And then uh, this is the another one that I give to my student. This is uh, a journey exercise. Also, I, I'm not sure from which collection of journey exercise is taken, but it is in the book called Hello, Mr. Gillock, Carl Journey. There's a comic on top there. Now, this is a good concept attitude for students who are going to grade grade three. This covers are more technical already. So you could see, you know that. It has chord, so you have the elbowing movement and then a scale. And so on. So it's a good one to to consolidate like all the technique that you learn like, from the lower grade. Now then now let's go to the next one. Scales. Now this is uh, this particular uh, particular slide like, actually belongs to the part two, but I decided to bring to the part one because I think that like, a lot of you are interested like to know like, how to play scale correctly. Now unfortunately the little camera is down, so uh, I will try my best uh, to explain this side uh, uh, in in a way that is uh, easy to to see. Now when we play scale, like, it's actually like a, uh, it's actually using a combination of finger and elbow action now so and i explained to you just now earlier that most of the time like when we play scale light like, they actually appear like quite fast and have to be played like in a way like that is non legato so you can see that you know that like example just now in the turkish march there is an a major scale and so on like that now just now in the Clement Sonatina. See, it's quite fast, huh? Now, this is grade 5, and you have to play this clearly. So, that is sometimes, you know, it's a, it's a kind of irony because uh, the exam itself uh, does not require the skill to be played that fast, uh, but in the actual playing, you have to play them a lot faster. And a lot of students uh, often stumble at this because they realize wait when when this scale appear in pieces like they, they are much faster. So that's why it's very important to get the technique right from the start from the grade one or beginner stage. Now uh, I wanna recommend you to teach scale at the beginner stage. Maybe after a few months of lesson when the finger shape and the elbow position are more or less stable, then you can introduce like the finger the, the scales. Now we need to use close shape high elbow position and then the fingers are going up and down now just now what i say about the elbow action now we will 
add in later, but really is that at the first stage, right, the student uh, should be able to just play them with the finger movement. Then you shift. Just shift. Now, I wrote here like, do not tap the thumb. Now, I understand that like, a lot of the older teachers side like to teach this. So, this is what they did, they taught. Then tuck the thumb under the second finger, tuck the thumb below finger, and then the thumb now on the F and play. Now, modern pedagogy taught us like, this is not so good because there's a lot of tension like acquired like in the thumb. Now, can you just give me one minute? Okay, sorry. Now there's the plight like, of having children so often like you know that they get very noisy. Now, <coughs> so you see here now. Uh, just now uh, picking up from where we left off. So do not tuck the thumb. Remember what I say just now that one factor of good technique like you need to make the movement like as efficient as you can. That means like. Less movement, less is more. Tucking in the thumb introduces another movement and it makes it like less efficient and more tension. So, finger action. Now, so what happened here like, now to shift the position, we just move the, open up the elbow. Then you can see the hand become like that. And then, now, naturally that you see here the thumb like, will be near the F and just nice. Then you can play the F. So it's not pure so it's not really pure finger action at the fast tempo. Now so it is there's that kind of movement also. Now if you play twins together and a lot of people do not know about this side, you do have to play the left hand soft and shallower. Now if you play them twins together same like you will sound this. There you go. Just now what I say, lower register. Because string, so the left hand will actually sound louder if you play them equal. So to balance them out nicely, you have to play the left hand softer. So, and then also that if you are playing this for ABRS ham, it's not written in the syllabus, but everybody knows that like, to get the full mark, you need to do the dynamics. So soft to loud and then loud to soft again. Now, then arpeggios. <sighs> okay, so this is the difficult one to explain. Now, for most of us, uh, fairly, fairly few of us actually learn how to play arpeggio correctly. Even when it comes to like full time music student, like many like still do not know how to play arpeggio correctly. That like uh, I just watch a. Uh, a lecture by Marai McLachlan, uh, one of the lecturer at the Chatham School of Music and he also wrote this book on the principle of piano technique. I encourage you to read them. Very important books on piano pedagogy nowadays. Now he also said he also said that like you know that even his own student at the colleges uh, still have bad arpeggio playing. All this because that like arpeggio playing is introduced like way too early in the exam. Now, if you watch my earlier lecture, you will know that like I don't encourage like lower grade for my student. And the reason is like one and one of these uh, is because there are like, a lot of things that uh, are introduced too early. Like example, arpeggio playing. Personally, like I will only introduce arpeggio playing like from grade three onward if possible but i know that like the abrsm already started testing them at grade two yeah so uh it is not exactly ideal but i will still but let me just show you what is a good arpeggio playing 
Now, arpeggio mode playing like despite how it looks like like is actually like almost fully elbow movement. Now, let me repeat it again to you. Elbow movement, specifically horizontal elbow movement. Now, so what happened here? Now I'm going to play for you the left arpeggio C major. So you see here. So I'm going to move. I'm going to generate the movement from the elbow. So I'm going to open up my elbow. Now look carefully at my hand. Now you realize that here, lah, I don't open up fully my hand to reach all the notes. Now that is probably like the critical error a lot of people like to make. They think, oh, you know that arpeggios are like broken chords, so I need to place my finger side all on the notes of the arpeggio. Sample C major, C here, I put here, C, E, G, C. Now, if you are an adult Caucasian, this is no issue. But if you are an Asian like me with small hands, and if you are young children, that is not possible. Now, and that will cause a lot of tension problem. That's why you see here, like that. If you see carefully, even yourself, even a lot of teachers when they play arpeggio, like the fingers were completely fat because that they try to stretch the fingers to reach all the notes. Now, but what we need to do, we need to use the elbow movement to reach the note instead. So you can see here, like now, if you see carefully here, unfortunately that I cannot use the camera to show you because I want to, I want it to point down here, that you can see here, like my fourth finger, like is actually not exactly at the E. So you can see my thumb at the letter C, my second finger at the letter G, but my fourth finger is somewhere in between E and F. Now this position, like you may think, is not ideal, but don't worry, we still can reach the note. Now. The point here, like you, you want the finger side to remain curved in the extended position or claw shape. Now, in the I wrote here for by default, most people will play arpeggio with extended hand shape, and I think that's a good one to do. Now, so you see here, I will open up my elbow, lay the note, then slowly open up my elbow, and you can see the fourth finger now naturally like moves to the letter E. I don't actually have to physically move my wrist or fingers. The elbow movement naturally moves the wrist and the finger to the letter E. Now I'll show you again. You see my my letter my fourth finger now at the letter F now, but now with the with the elbow movement it goes to the letter E. Now this is important. So. If you are never taught to play arpeggio this way, give it a try. You realize that you will acquire la a new sense of freedom when you play arpeggio. So you can see, you can play very fast and very cleanly. Now you can see. Now you can see here, my thumb la is fully relaxed. My thumb is never never goes under the hand. Now so another bad habit that a lot of older teachers like to teach also. In Singapore, like you said, you know they like to do this, and that is absolutely horrendous for the hand. So, if you are doing this, cut it away. Now, another common problem is you can see here, like the often that you know we have what we call the wave twisting motion. Now that happens ah when you think of moving the fingers ah to the right note, so you get this. Then they then they will move the thumb very high to prepare for the C. So you get this movement. That is, of course, not good. You can see when I do this, it looks very effortless. Yeah. Now, I mean, uh, same like scale arpeggio are sometimes uh are seen in fast tempo. Like example, you know that uh like you you know that example. Let me see what example here. Like this is from the Schubert. Now that's difficult to play because it's that quite fast. But you can see that you see after you. Now if you do if you do not have a good arpeggio movement, you can't play up to speed. Now I'm still uh working on that piece in progress, but there are many other pieces. Ah, maybe for at least as one famous passage. And 
then followed by a chromatic scale, right? See? Now, so there is also another example. Now, if you can demonstrate this to a student, right, with actual passages from the patrola, then they may be able to see reason to why they have to learn all this correctly. Now, I know that it's not easy, like, to convince students to do the, all this, uh, because that they say, but I could play it just fine with a bad habit. Why should I learn the correct way? That's why they cannot see far enough. But we as a teacher, like, we can see the big picture. So we want to make sure that like, they can uh, uh, they can future-proof themselves like, and uh, learn the correct lead like, from the start. So you see. Now, of course, the fingering not exactly standard fingering, but the principle is the same. You see, open up the elbow first. Then you can see the thumb is relaxed, the thumb is just hanging there, very relaxed. The elbow movement bring it to the position. Now, in the actual playing that light, you have to accept that light. There will be slight gap when you shift the position. It is actually like impossible to connect all the notes of arpeggio. And this is something that like that, I think that a lot of the older teachers are often like, they are so obsessed, you must connect all the notes. But in the fast tempo, like, you see, you can't really tell, like, <laughs> yeah, so a slight gap is okay. In fact, that, like, it actually clarifies like, the note a bit better. So it is okay to leave a slight gap. Now, uh, there's actually more steps, like, to learn arpeggio properly, but I just tell you the gist of it today. That's why you know that you, uh, we need a tutorial session like, for this kind of lecture because uh, this kind of lecture so you could actually like go to the piano like, and actually uh, test out and apply like whatever you have learned in this lecture now that is actually like you know the, the end of the lecture I mean that like, I actually modified this like this slide like today because it was actually part of uh, it was actually quite different like from the first time I presented this the first time I presented this lecture, it was a lot more unwieldy and large, but I try to keep it like a bit more concise today. Now, so thanks for uh, watching this lecture. Now, this is the final lecture that I offer freely online, and uh, I will probably be revising again the earlier two lectures uh, with a nicer slide and nicer camera. But today, like today, lectures are still done live, but I have shared to you my plan to do all this uh, professionally recorded with different angles and uh, properly record, properly done slide so I hope to see that happen now uh, for those who are interested to do this course you don't have to be a teacher to do this course you could maybe uh, be a grade 8 student a diploma student you could also do this course and improve your playing in general now we will do the in-person lectures and tutorial like the moment this circuit breaker enters the phase two, uh, which are you know, according to our politicians, is going to start like somewhere in the end of June. So hopefully that like you know we could start that like uh early end of June, early July. So if some of you want to do the exam in the February or March, it could make it in time because we still have to write a paper. Now, uh. For those who are interested, who are doing the higher grades teaching, now I'm happy to announce that like the next few lectures I'll be conducting online like will be geared towards high level playing and specifically the grade eight and diploma. I will keep you posted. I'm still deciding what topic to present, but the first one will happen two weeks later, and you know that uh, I hope that like that I could see. Uh, I could still see some of you there and you know that even if, if even you are just teaching lower grade now I'm sure that some of you will want to teach higher grades in the future so it's good like to equip yourself like from now no need to wait until you actually have higher grade uh, diploma student then you figure out what to do it's okay to always like you know to look ahead and have all the skill sets ready when you need them now and I'm also happy to announce that I'll be launching like a set of scale book to coincide with the launch of the new ABSM syllabus. Now it will probably be available like as soon 
as possible hopefully within the first week of the launch of the new syllabus now i'll keep you posted but uh, you know that it's an exciting time and uh, there'll be probably an, another like uh, another lecture like uh, just focusing on that uh on that uh, book and how to play scale and arpeggio in, in general now thank you for attending this lecture now i hope that whatever you learn today is beneficial to you and you can apply that to your own playing and to also to your students now hope to see you again for the next lecture thank you for attending bye bye <laughs>